What is going on, guys, and welcome back to another episode right here on PickSwap Media. The NBA draft is nearly here, and the first real opportunity of the offseason for each NBA team to begin rebuilding their dream roster will begin with that mark. So I want to talk specifically about the Sixers angle tonight. There's a good amount of draft breakdowns that both myself and Ryan Coyle of Beef Up Front have already put out on the channel, so there's plenty of players to dive into if you want a deeper dive. But I do want to approach this from the Sixers-specific angle and talk about the top five targets that I do have for this team. As of now, the Sixers are holding the 16th pick in the first round as well as a second round pick. I do expect them to move around a decent bit during the draft. I don't know if they're going to just sit still there, but I'm very much for them selecting a young prospect and bringing him into the organization. I think as a whole, the Sixers have passed up too many opportunities to add young talent and they don't come along all that often. So I'm going to dive into the top names that I do expect. I'm going to start at five and work my, my work my way back, talk a little about the stats, the skill set, and look at some highlights for each of these players. So I'm going to start at number five with Jared McCain out of Duke. And I'll begin by pulling up his stats here. He is a one-and-done player, was a freshman at Duke this season. Overall in the year, averaged 14.3 points per game. Five rebounds, which I do think is notable for a six foot three guard, 1.9 assists, 1.1 steal, just 1.3 turnover, which is a pretty solid number there. His shooting is going to be his calling card as a player. Shot 41.4% from three on 5.8 three point attempts per game, 46.2% from the field overall. As I mentioned, he is a one and done player at Duke. Uh, he is still one of the younger players in this year's draft class. And let's begin by looking at a little bit of film from him as I talk through the next parts of it here. So here we are, the Jared McCain highlights. He did a lot. He played mostly on ball for Duke, but he's a guy that I expect to project as a bit of a combo guard at the next level. He can put the ball on the floor. He can be a guy that attacks the basket. I think that is an area of game. It will be a more difficult challenge when he is facing the bigger NBA talent and the, the range of players that obviously that the NBA dictates there. Uh, for Jared McCain specifically, he's a unique character. That uh, He's a guy that paints his nails. He's got a unique personality, but don't let that confuse you for a guy that is soft. He knows exactly who he is, and he wears on his sleeve in a way that I quite respect. His shooting is going to be his calling card as a player, but I do think that there is playmaking upside there. He has a real chance to end up as the best shooter in this year's draft class, and that's saying something when there's guys like Zachary Reese and Dalton Connect in this class as well. I think there's going to be a great deal of offense run for him from an off-ball setting that I think he's going to truly fit that combo guard type mold. I wish he was a little bit bigger at six foot three. He's not a guy who strikes me as a pure point guard. As I mentioned, less than two assists per game. It is the shooting that's going to be the number one thing. And if you need any more evidence of it, just take a look at the JMU game in the tournament where he scored 30 points on eight three-pointers and absolutely dominated that game. Scored 22 of his points in the first half. He's got a nice little runner that I like as well. You can kind of see that on that pass play. I'm going to go back to there. This is a valuable shot in my mind that obviously a little bit of a smaller defender on him here from Vermont, but this type of angle and finish is something that I think is going to be very useful at the NBA level, particularly at his size. So a little bit of that in-between game, not quite a finish at the rim. Here's a little him playing a little two-man game with Kyle Filipowski, and this is where I think he can truly punish teams. That he jumps, dumps it to Filipowski in the post. The second they double, he comes to get the shot and knocks it down. That's going to be real deal Jared McCain's role at the NBA level. He will constantly be commanding this level of pressure to not allow players to leave him from the opposing team. And again, this is that JMU game that I mentioned where he knocked down eight threes and scored 30 points. 22 of those points coming in the first half where he really put the game to bed. He's also got a nice energy I love that he plays with. One of the things that I think has become so infectious with Tyrese Maxey is the way that a smile never leaves his face. It's not quite the same demeanor with Jared McCain, and Maxey obviously has the intensity as well. It's not like this guy doesn't care. He clearly does to a high level. But Jared McCain cut from a similar cloth. If you'll feel his energy over the flow of the game, as I mentioned, he is a unique personality and the shooting form I absolutely love. That it's the same thing every single time. The footwork especially stands out to me. Look at the way he set, catch, release in such a rapid and efficient motion there. 
That is the Jared McCain story. So in general, I do lean towards I would prefer the archetype of a wing that I do think there's a decent amount of wings. But I think Jared McCain is special enough as a shooter that the Sixers should have no problem selecting him at the 16th pick. And I've even seen a couple mocks where they've moved around, dropped down a couple picks and walked away with McCain. That would be a huge success if that is the case. So I am locking in Jared McCain as my number five option for the Sixers in this year's draft picks. Now, to move on to number four, talk about a guy a little bit different. Kind of come from a similar mold that he is a freshman guard, and that is Isaiah Collier here. That This is a pick that, to me, feels like a Daryl Morey pick. And to dive into what he brought on the floor this year, 16.3 points per game, 4.3 assists, 2.9 rebounds, 1.5 steals, shot just 33.8% from three on three attempts per game, 49% from the field overall, another guy that is a one and done. 3.3 turnovers, which is a noteworthy stat there. That is far higher than you would like it. Uh, Collier is kind of a bit of two stories this season. Uh, that I would say the first half of his season went really not the way he wanted whatsoever. That This is a player that had top five draft pick, potential number one pick potential coming into the season, and he clearly did not live up to it. Now, part of the reason that I'm optimistic about Collier is what a mess this USC team was. This was a team that had strong tournament aspirations this year, ended the season below 500, never found a way to fully click, and frankly, I don't put that fully on Collier. And I even think stylistically looking at his game, I think he's going to translate better at the NBA level. Now, I do wish he was a bit of a better shooter. I've kind of compared him to Jaden Ivey in the past, and I've even said year one Jaden Ivey. Watching him live, I kind of, it's interesting. Watching him live throughout the college season, I was pretty out on Isaiah Collier. I have bought back in a great deal during this pre-draft process, watching some of the workouts, watching some of the combine stuff, and really just diving back into the tape. I think from a skill set standpoint, I slept on him a little, and I also, as I referenced, I think USC was much more of a mess than I gave them credit. And that's also part of the reason why I hesitate to be so critical of Brownie James, obviously, to be called spade a spade. Like, he's just not an NBA prospect right now or an NBA-ready player. But I do think that there were some problems with that USC team, which, once again, went below 500 and missed the tournament outright. But to talk more about Isaiah Collier specifically, you can see kind of the archetype of another combo guard-type player that he is a guy that I think is more comfortable off ball than he gets credit. I'm a believer in the shot. I know the numbers aren't incredibly intriguing right now that a guy that's 33.8% from beyond the arc, that is a number that's going to need to improve at the next level, especially as the three point line extends a little bit farther out. But I do believe in the overall shooting motion. I think he will get better with time. And the other thing that I'll say about Collier, I think he did himself a great service by returning from injury mid-year. A lot of people expect him to chalk it up and prepare for the NBA draft. And he proved a lot in that second half of the season. I thought he played basketball that was much more conducive to winning as a team. Thought he flashed a little bit more of his playmaking uh, chops. And you can see a 30% assist rate is pretty strong there. That's a nice look for a player cutting in. I don't know if he's ever going to be your point guard point guard. But I think in the modern day NBA, he can be a guy that's your most ball dominant player or potentially a player that can guard off ball or be a guy that is more of an off ball player. And that's a read that I particularly like. This will be something that is very valuable at the NBA level. Look at this little duck in here. Sets the screen, rolls. Look at this little window. Just delivers it on the money finish. That's a, that's a high level pass right there. That is something that he can absolutely build off. And I do think overall his calling card will still be as a scorer. I think the defensive ability is there. But I think his playmaking is worth noting. And again, I did mention that Collier to me feels like a Daryl Morey type pick. He tends to love the players that fall down the board. And I think he can be viewed in that mindset that I think if you were to run back the Isaiah Collier experience in college one more season, he probably would be talked about much differently. And I think that Daryl will view that as a chance to take an upside swing while getting a win now piece. So Isaiah Collier, I have locked in as my number four pick. For number three on my list of top Sixers targets, a guy a bit cut from a very different mold. And this is the most true wing that I've talked about to this point, this being Ron Holland of the G League Ignite. So in the G League regular season in 14 games, he averaged 20.6 points per game, 6.6 .6 rebounds, 3.0 assists, 2.5 steals per game, 2.9 turnovers, which is a little bit high there. The biggest concern with Ron Holland is the shooting. There are some real deal concerns here. Shot just 24% from three on 3.6 attempts per game. Also just 75.7% at the free throw line, 44.5% from the field overall. And if you want to look at his showcase cup stats, the shooting splits get even a little bit worse. That 47.4% from the field overall, 23.9% from three, and just 68.2% at the free throw line. Still average 18.5 points, 6.7 rebounds, 2.8 assists, 2.1 steals, and 1.1 block per game so not all bad by any means but the shoot is going to be the or the shooting form and ability is going to be the biggest swing scale for what this guy is capable now while i have legitimate concerns about the shooting 
I just have such a legitimate respect for how high how high the the rate that Ron Holland competes is. He is a terror in transition. And I think that's going to be where most of his offense comes from. Some of the criticism of him is not just the shooting, but like the over willingness to be a shooter that he certainly kind of circles himself, creating his own shot in a way that he probably didn't even have the right to do at the G league ignite. And certainly will not on an NBA team. There's a lot of talent on the team. You see Matas Buzelos dapping him up after that, who I like quite a bit as well. He will certainly be off the board in the top 10 and more before the Sixers get a chance to pick But for Ron Holland. I just believe in the floor as a high level defensive player, an elite athlete and a guy that is willing to work. Like I'm a believer in the work rate, the energy you feel his presence over the course of an NBA game or of a basketball game in a way that I don't think you can quite say about a lot of players. Like look at his ability to get out and transition and dunk it. I think that's going to be his offense. I think he's going to be kind of end up as sort of an Aaron Gordon type player where he's a defense first guy who can make impact and transition, do the dirty work. And some of that will take him buying into his role. And by the way, this is me kind of projecting the lower part of Ron Holland. Obviously, the shooting is going to be the swing skill. If he turns into just a league average three-point shooter, we're talking about one of these premier wings in the NBA. And that is a huge upside swing to me. So he's a guy that was talked about as pretty much a lock for the top 10 for a good portion of the season. There's some real deal concerns from NBA teams about the shooting specifically, that it does sound like he's a guy trending towards slipping on draft day. So I did want to keep him on my top five targets for the Sixers for that specific reason. I think more likely than not, he will not be on the board, but if he is, I think he probably slides up to number one. The couple guys I'm going to get into here. It's interesting. I think this year more so than ever that the draft is all over the place, that it's tough to fully identify who will be available. And from the Sixers perspective, They've Daryl Morey, even dating back to before his Sixers era, has shown kind of the track record for when you see a guy slipping, you jump all over him. Rob Dillingham's another player that I will bring up real quick is not on my list of top fives, mainly of the assumption that he will be drafted. But there's some real buzz that he might be a name that slides. And I would not hesitate to take a sliding Kentucky guard that has fallen down draft boards because that, that uh, has a pretty strong success rate. And these Sixers know pretty well from Tyrese Maxey. And I've just seen Dillingham take over games on the offense, man. There are some real deal defensive concerns there. And it's interesting, Dillingham and Ron Holland that are kind of cut from a similar mold, that they're both kind of projected to be the players sliding. They're exact opposites as player. That for, for Rob Dillingham, he's going to be an offensive-minded guy who can carry the weight of the team, but really will never be an adequate defender, even on the best days. For Ron Holland, the upside is far higher and his floor is much different that he's always going to be a high level defender. This guy turned out to be a bust, So I feel bad throwing in the same conversation, but his film reminds me a little bit of Josh Jackson when he was coming out the way that like he relies on his athleticism, the hunger, the competitiveness. And again, Josh Jackson didn't find a way to stick in the league. So I don't want to stick that bad juju on Ron Holland, but something just stylistically that compares to me. So I do have Ron Holland locked in as my number three option for the Sixers there. Let's move on to number two, which is probably my favorite player straight up, maybe even in this entire draft class and certainly in the area where the Sixers are picking, and that is Tristan De Silva. Tristan De Silva is a guy who's a four-year player at Colorado, finished his senior season in which he averaged 16 points per game, 5.1 rebounds, 2.4 assists, 1.1 steals per game, shot uh, from beyond the three-point arc 39.5% on 4.8 three-point attempts per game, and it's pretty consistent that you know what you're, what you're getting. That Just the year before, just .01 percent uh worse at 39.4 percent from beyond the arc he's a guy who to me just screams is going to be a high level fifth starter or rotation player on a winning basketball team for the entirety of his basketball career that i see no world in which like this guy is played out of the league in which some of the other guys that i've talked about such as ron holland i certainly think it's possible with De Silva, he's going to find a way to stick on a winning team. And it was interesting. Colorado this year had a lot of talent this year. I ended up watching a lot of Colorado, mainly because of Cody Williams getting buzzed as the potential top-picked college player. Tristan De Silva was the guy that popped to me just about every every time. And KJ Simpson, I'll show a lot, a lot of love to as well. I do believe in him from an NBA standpoint. I think he's a worthwhile second-round flyer. Also, my guy Eddie Lampkin holding things down in the middle there. Colorado was a fun team to watch. But it is Tristan De Silva that I feel the strongest about projecting to the NBA level. This is probably the lowest floor or the lowest ceiling out of all the players that I mentioned, but I just think he's such an intelligent basketball player. His off ball cutting is probably the number one thing that stands out to me. He's going to be a just fine shooter, an adequate catch and shooter, an adequate defender. He's just going to do everything right in a way. And there is a little bit of pop when he does attack the rim in a way that I don't think he quite gets credit for. Ultimately, 
there's things that he's going to have to improve on. He's going to have to be a higher volume three point shooter, improve a little bit defensively, but he can just do a little bit of everything in a way that I think is really refreshing, really solid, and will help whatever team that he lands on. He, to me, once again, is probably the most sure thing in this area of where they're picking. And while you can argue the Dalton connects to the world, or even a guy like Donovan Klingon might be a little bit more of a, a sure thing, just as far as how they project to the NBA level, the Silva skill set to me, I just think is great. I love the way that like, basically you throw him in whatever role your team needs and he's going to find a way to do it. He's that kind of player. I'm very excited about his game. And again, this is my personal preference. I know I put him at number two because there is a one guy that I do want to mention a little higher, but the Silva to me is probably the most likely, the most realistic and the best fit for the Sixers team. So I did lock in Tristan Silva at this number two spot here. Now to dive into my number one target, it is a popular name among Sixers fans. And that is Devin Carter here. Now, Devin Carter, I'll start with. Spent three years in college, at, uh, started at South Carolina, then moved over to Providence, improved a great deal each season. And this season, his junior year, ended with 19.7 points per game, 8.7 rebounds, which is crazy for a six foot three guard, 3.6 assists per game, 1.8 steal, 1.0 block, shot 37.7% from three on 6.8 three point attempts per game. He also got a ton of opportunities in which, like, the ball was thrown to him late in the shot clock. He got a grenade and still found a way to knock it down. He took some NBA range threes very often for this Providence team, led the Big East in scoring, and did it defensively. Now, that is the number one thing that jumps out, and I think that's what you're going to see on film right away is from day one. I think this gonna be guy is going to be a high-level uh, defender at the NBA level, and you can see here's a bit of his film here. You can see, like, it was also surprising me to see him measure in at six foot three at the combine. He never felt that small to me when watching him play. He plays far bigger than his size. There's a little Josh Hart in his game. I mean that from the rebounding standpoint and, of course, the defensive ability there. But there's more of an athletic pop. And honestly, I feel better about the shot than I do about Josh Hart's for sure. And he's also, from a personality standpoint, he's got that dog in him. Like, he, apparently, he's just been outperforming every single player that he's in workouts with. And we're talking about guys projected to go higher, like Dalton Connect. I know he kicked his ass in a workout and a couple others. Like, everyone that has talked to him feels incredibly highly of him. I do think he likely ends up as a top 10 pick, even though he's not perfect as a basketball player. But he does have that work rate, that desire to get better. And the floor of what it is right now is still really intriguing. That like a high level defender, a guy that's willing to shoot from three. I think he fits more into the shooting guard range. I would do wish he was a couple inches taller, but the bottom line is you're going to get a high level defender, a guy that can shoot the three, a guy that's willing to play on or off ball and a guy that will work his ass off to get better day in and day out. That is a very good player and would be a slam dunk for the Sixers team. So I do round out my top five with Devin Carter as my number one. So to rip through it one more time, my top five options for the Sixers team. Number one, I have Devin Carter. Number two, Tristan De Silva. Number three, Ron Holland. Number four, Isaiah Collier. And number five, Jared McCain there. If the Sixers walk away with any of those players, I think it would be a slam dunk for this team. I do hope that to be the case. So we'll see how things shake out from there. But very excited for this NBA draft. Once again, make sure you are tapping in to all the player pro prospect profiles that we do have out here on PixelWatt Media already. I'll be live during the draft on this channel, on Edge of Philly Sports, doing a bunch of stuff, so make sure to keep it locked for that. You can follow me on Twitter to stay stay up to date with all of that kind of stuff. Also, make sure you're checking out Sixers Digest, which I am attacking this a little bit more from the Sixers angle as well. Appreciate each and every one of you guys for tuning into this video. I'll talk with you next time right here on PixelWatt Media. Peace.